Dear listener, this is Christopher, and before today's episode, I just want to take this chance to give a shout out to three beautiful gentlemen who have been helping me improve the podcast in the shadows. So uh, first off, we have Amaro Koberle, who recently designed a new artwork for my podcast, and I love it! Yeah, it's so, so amazing. He's so talented, and uh, I look way cooler in the artwork than I actually look in real life. So that's a plus. Thanks a million, man. I, I appreciate it so much. Amaro also told me to tell you that if you aim to spread the ideas associated with critical rationalism and the David Deutsch worldview and can use some art to help with that pursuit, that he might help you for free. Yeah, so if you need some podcast cover art, website banners, logos, profile pics, or any sort of visuals, you can hit him up at amaro at amarocoberle.com. Uh, links will be in the show notes. Yeah, I would also say that Amaro has many different styles that he can paint in. So what he did for me is not his particular thing. That's just what I wanted. So make sure you go to his website, amorocoberlay.com, and check out his portfolio. There's a lot of cool stuff in there. Next up, we have Graham Besselier. And what Graham does for me is he takes my episodes and he runs a de over them to soften any harsh S sounds that I tend to make a lot on the podcast. So he's the one protecting your ears from chronic damage from listening to me. So we're very grateful for what you do, Graham. Thanks a lot. And I know that Graham also has his own website, cgbesselier.com. He's an artist working in photo, video, sound production. So if you need any of that done, definitely check him out as well. Last but not least, we have my man, Nicholas Lundmark known as uh, Optimisticism on Twitter. And uh, what he does is he creates the timestamps for us so we can easily find the juicy parts of each episode. So a big thank you to you too, Nick. I appreciate all three of you. I'm very, very grateful. Thank you. All right, so I'm back on the podcast with Sarah Fitzclaridge. Sarah, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. All right, so let's jump into the topic that I want to discuss with you today here. So romantic relationships. And we, maybe let's start here then with the angle of one of the most classic debates, which is the idea of, okay, monogamy, is that the good thing? Is that the right thing? Or should you be uh, in open relationships or polyamorous? And um, I think it's fun because I know that you used to be uh, against uh, monogamy, actually, and I know that you've turned around since then. And uh, I'm also very uh, sympathetic towards monogamy. I mean, I'm in a marriage, a long-term mar marriage. And uh, to avoid that we're just sitting here agreeing with each other the whole time and just talking about what we're persuaded of already, maybe it could be fun if we could start with, yeah, some arguments that you used to be persuaded by. Like, what are sure. some arguments against monogamy? And we can take it from there. First of all, just to clarify, I saw it as an unsolved problem, monogamy, but I also thought that the open or poly relationships was also an unsolved problem. It's not that I thought that poly was a solution. I gave a, right. a speech about this in, well, I don't know, 20, 21 years ago or something. And the problem that I saw with monogamy was I was imagining this marriage in which growth that takes you in directions which threaten to take you away from the marriage or your partner away from the marriage need to be curtailed or avoided. So I thought that that's inherently coercive. I was asking, where do you draw the line between completely avoiding all outside activities and interests, since any of them might develop in ways that might threaten the relationship, and pursuing your own growth of knowledge? Hmm. And I said, since we can't predict the growth of knowledge, we can't predict how our own knowledge will grow. We can't predict which of those activities and interests will threaten the relationship. 
But I also talked about the problem I saw with poly and open relationships. I didn't claim to have a solution. I saw it as an unsolved problem. I did think for a while, realised I was mistaken, that there's no reason for non-monogamous relationships to end because you're not sort of ending with one person and starting up with another monogamous relationship. But that actually right. turned out to be a mistaken assumption. The number of so-called dyed-in-the-wool anti-monogamists who suddenly become a monogamist and get married and end all their non-monogamous relationships is actually quite a high proportion. I also said that open relationships were tried in the 60s and were a complete disaster. And in <laughs> fact, <laughs> more recently, uh, the, just to continue on that theme for a bit, there's a, a psychotherapist in the Bay Area who talked about how the Bay Area poly community has created a thriving business for her because everyone is supposed to be cool with whatever happens in terms of their intimate relationships and it's all supposed right. to be peace and joy and love and light and stuff. And she talked about how negative emotions like fear, anxiety and jealousy are just absolutely unacceptable. And she said that she's never seen people more emotionally disturbed and troubled than those in the poly community, because there's this self-delusion going on. People feel these negative feelings, but they, they have to. to deny it. Right. Because they have this view that having those human emotions makes you immature, unenlightened, deep psychological problems. She said that the community really looks down on people who feel those things while saying things that sound incredibly reasonable, like, this is not a judgment, it's just an observation, as they kick the person who is feeling, you know, <laughs> metaphorically, of course. Yeah. And she described this artificial weirdness of shutting emotions down and everyone hiding behind a mask that's socially acceptable to the poly community. Yeah. So anyway, here's how my problem of open relationships argument went 20 years ago or whenever it was. Hmm. What I said was, I suppose that both partners in this open marriage are convinced by the argument for having an open relationship. If I pursue my interests and growth of knowledge with others, then however much my partner may agree that that's what I should do, he will fear the loss of the relationship because the relationship may indeed end as a result of my growth of knowledge taking me away from it. So he's going to feel threatened and that's going to affect his actions and the way he interacts with me. And he's going to stop investing deeply in our relationship. He'll make preparations for loss, which means that potential growth of knowledge in the relationship will be lost. So I recognise that the institution of sexually and emotionally exclusive, fully committed marriage is an involved institution embodying knowledge, mm -hmm. and that replacing it is it's just not a simple matter. So I, I just didn't actually think that there was a solution, uh, in fact. Right. Okay, so, you, so okay, I didn't know that. That's interesting. So you, you, yeah. it wasn't that you were especially anti-monogamy. It was you, you didn't think there was any good solution. Well, I wasn't saying that I had a solution. I thought that there was this inherent problem with the institution of monogamy, but I also thought that there was an inherent problem with the institution of open relationships. Yeah. Okay. So, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a hard that's a hard starting point to to start dating. That must have been tough. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that nobody really has any idea how to do open relationships in a way that isn't just utterly ghastly from the point of view of knowledge creation. Oh wow, that's interesting. Okay, yeah. So 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 I I don't have super strong opinions uh, either way here i do think that the the binary black and white thinking of either monogamy is the best thing for everyone or or everyone should have an open relationship i think that's not 
the answer here. I think it's it's very nuanced and people are very different. And a lot of it is contingent on what you actually want. But yeah, so I, I also think there is there are probably good and bad ways to do both of those. I think there are probably good and bad monog- monogamous relationships, clearly, and the same is true of the, the polygamous ones. But there might be different factors that make one harder than the other in general. And uh, it might be the case that polyamory is more difficult because of the romantic memes that we have and the culture that we currently have. But um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it's because of romantic memes. I could be mistaken, but to me... That's implied. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's like the open relationships thing is incoherent. It's committing to non-commitment. And to me, that seems seems incoherent. Anti-monogamy people say, as I've probably said in the past, that monogamy is this coercive institution, therefore the answer is to throw it out. But that's mm. a bit like the libertarian argument against military defence. They argue against countries having a military because taxation is theft and the government is a coercive institution. Well, one day in the future, we may well have the knowledge of how to do defence without a government and taxation, but we don't have the knowledge now. I don't think that we have the knowledge of how to do open relationships now. I know you disagree, but... (laughs) Mm. Well, well, I I hope we do because that's always fun. I think, uh, so, <laughs> yeah. but so and and it's a, a great way. I mean, I don't know if you've ever heard my my new donation intro to the podcast, but I, I I've kind of used a tagline that I want this to be a platform for the fun and friendly exchange of interesting ideas, and so as long as a disagreement is fun and friendly, that's probably one of my favorite things. Because then you really get to do the intellectual wrestle and, and try out different pieces of the puzzle. Yeah, I think that's, that's a nice uh, environment of learning, actually, in my opinion. So, so I really enjoy yeah. that. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, so let's see if we can uh, dive into some of the specific opinions here then. Because yeah, c- clearly there are, are problems with romantic memes and monogamy as it stands now. I mean, we have... I don't think that's necessarily true. Obviously, there are there are problems, but I'm not sure that we would agree about what they are. It depends right. what you mean, I suppose. <laughs> so, what are you talking about specifically? Yeah, no, that's that's a good question. So, so I guess I'm referring to things like st- statistics, like over fifty percent of marriages end in divorce. I think that's actually because people don't commit properly; they never commit. The modern way of being married is what I would call not committed. It's like continuing as they were before, except that they're married. That doesn't work. Yes. That's yes, that yes, is yes. not investing in the relationship. No, I think I think that's right. But so you wouldn't say that that's an issue with uh, us lacking the knowledge of what what a truly monogamous committed relationship is, because that's I guess how I would frame it. The idea that that monogamy itself is an anti-rational meme, say, I don't agree with that. Yes. No, there, there we agree. And I think that the common view, if I may speak for, for people and generalize here, I think many people, also judging from the Twitter questions that I got when I said we were going to speak about this, many people seem to think that there's something inherently coercive in a monogamous relationship, right? And I, I, I guess that that is what we both oppose here. Well, when I'm talking about monogamy, I think I'm talking about something slightly different from you because I mean sexually and emotionally exclusive monogamy. Yes. No, I would say the same thing. Okay. <laughs> why, why, why do you think I, I would disagree with that? I thought that you favor open marriages, sexually open marriages, say. Yeah, I, I'm not settled on whether the monogamous way is the only way to do a great relationship. 
Yeah, so, so I guess I would differentiate there. I, I do agree with you that monogamy to me is just uh, sexually and emotionally exclusive. And uh, I'm just not convinced that that's always the best way to go about it. I think that must be dependent on the specific problem situation of the two people involved and what their goals are with the whole thing. I think that that's missing something. I think that that is mm. missing what is possible when you fully commit to each other. It just still slightly sounds as though you are talking about uncommitted monogamy, which is very likely to not work. Right. But so, so work for the purpose of what then? To last, say. Okay, yes. And to create an incredible knowledge-creating institution. Right. I think that fully committed, thoroughly exclusive marriage mm -hmm. is a deeply knowledge-creating institution. It's an involved tradition embodying knowledge. And it's utopian to throw that out in the absence of a better idea. But the modern idea of marriage is let's all be so-called mature and flexible and not fully commit, as I would see it. And I think that what that does is that means that your attention and your creativity, you are going more for breadth of knowledge rather than depth of knowledge with one person. And yes. the problem is that then you're not creating the knowledge in your marriage that makes it possible for it to be incredible and to just keep on improving and improving and more and more knowledge created together. It's actually not in people's interests to be in this kind of modern, non-committed kind of thing. I don't actually know why people bother getting married if they don't want to be all in, wholehearted, fully committed. I don't get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, I actually agree with you on that. So, so yeah, what I want to do here is I think we're, I'm sympathetic towards most of what you think here, uh, I'm pretty sure. But but I want to play with it a little bit and, and play sure. devil's advocate here just to hash out some stuff. And so I like the distinction of breadth versus depth of knowledge mm -hmm. here. And I do think that a common misunderstanding of monogamy is the idea that Oh, it's best in the beginning when you have all the fireworks and everything is new, novel and interesting. And then it just gets slowly worse and it goes into uh, this boring ass uh, everyday life and it's predictable and it's, you, you know, everything about each other. You know, I, I don't think that's true. I think that's the, the view of the false monogamy, non-committed uh, thing that you mentioned before. I agree. Where I think that people are as most of the people listening to this know already we are unpredictable in in principle and we are these in internal universes of knowledge creation right and interesting unique quirks and ideas and problems and and yeah i i like using my own life as an example and and my wife i've been together with her for almost 7 years now almost 7 years married and yeah, actually, I want to share a, a story from, from the other day where when, when I leave for work, we always try to kiss, you know, say goodbye. And we have this really cheesy thing, you know, you never know if you're going to get hit by a car or something like that. So let's, let's try to be sweet, the last thing we do when we see each other, right? So she kissed me and she said, hurry on home to me. And I almost get teary-eyed thinking about it. That was like the cutest thing I've heard her mm -hmm. say in seven years. She still surprises me every day like that. And so I, I don't buy into that at all. I think you, you, then you haven't really got it. And then you're not curious enough about your partner if it gets more boring. I think it gets greater uh, the longer I, you're together. Yeah, I think that what happens is in these modern uncommitted marriages that are going to fail, I think, is <laughs> that instead of turning towards each other and exploring each other really fully and going for it with each other, people are still spreading their attention widely like they were before they were married. And then they wonder 
a few months down the line or a year or two down the line, what on earth happened and why it all became boring with the one they're married to? Well, maybe if they'd been investing all that attention and creativity in their marriage instead of outside their marriage, Mm -hmm. they wouldn't be in that situation. What you focus on is where you you are most likely to be creative. If you're not focused on your spouse, then how on earth do you think that this relationship is going to create deep knowledge and excitement and passion in the long term? And creating knowledge is what makes a relationship great in our view here. That's what leads to all the enjoyment and love and and, and, uh, well-being and stuff like that. Just, yeah. 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 So you're saying that when it comes to being in a relationship this type of full commitment is what you think is the the best way to create knowledge and thus have a great relationship right but yes. so are you saying that that is uh, inherently a better uh, thing to do than being let's say uh, single seeing a lot of people because you enjoy let's say sexual exploits with many different people and you also enjoy the the freedom as you see it to be single and not have any commitments to someone. Obviously, if you are such a person, then marriage is definitely a very bad idea for you. But I do think that at least now, a fully committed, exclusive marriage is the best known way to create a whole vast area of knowledge Depth of knowledge, I think, does ultimately create more knowledge than breadth of knowledge because it, there's more randomness in spreading it around more mm. widely. But I'm obviously not saying that anyone who thinks of marriage as a prison or isn't persuaded that the thing to do is to fully, wholeheartedly commit. Obviously, I wouldn't say that that kind of person should be getting married. Of course, they shouldn't. That would obviously not be a disaster. Yeah. Yes, I mean, I, I mean, there are some uh, different statements about these things that I hear quite often, and I've been trying mm-hmm. to do a little research here on both sides just to hear what people usually object with or, or think about in terms of this, because there are problems that the other side seem to solve better in this this mistaken view, if you if you contrast polyamory with a uh, maybe stereotypical view of monogamy, non committed, not fully committed, then you have certain things that polyamory polyamory or or uh, open relationships seem to solve. But so so for instance, I was discussing this with uh, a friend recently, where yeah, you you see people thinking that cheating, for instance, cheating is. Like one of the, the the most morally outrageous things you can do. Like it's it's uh, very looked down upon, but it's it's just interesting to me that I think that cheating, by the way, is an aspect of this modern uncommitted, unsatisfying oh, yeah. form of monogamy. Yes, if you're in an incredible marriage like why on earth if you've created all this knowledge including your white hot sexual connection why on earth would you be wanting to (laughs) go and have some sex with some other people who you don't know what you're doing and it's uh, you don't know each other i don't know what i'm doing anyway (laughs) the idea that that would be appealing when you have created this incredible connection in your marriage is absurd. I mean, I, yeah, I find that interesting and very intriguing. And at the same time, I'm trying to think up counterexamples like, why couldn't it be the case that... me? Okay, so let's put it like this. Meeting new people can also be very interesting, like the breadth that you were talking about of experience or or knowledge creation. It can be very fun in the beginning of of dating someone too, in a different way, in a completely different way from the fun you have in a really committed, passionate relationship. I don't see why inherently there would be a problem with, let's let's just say you are 
uh, in a relationship where one partner likes to travel a lot and you don't. And while you're apart, it's just a fact of the matter that one of you thinks it's really fun to go out dancing and clubbing and they think it's really fun to flirt or, or you know, or make out with a new person, whatever it is. What What is it that would take away from the commitment you have with each other by doing something like raunchily dancing with someone else when you're across the globe and kissing someone else? Je- not because of the... It's It's not really the same reason. Just like it can be fun to try something that's outside of your diet, say. It's just, uh, it's just something that's pleasurable to you. And in the same way, it would be fun and a cool experience to be in Tokyo by yourself uh, and your friends and you're uh, making out with this interesting person because that, that makes the experience more fun. And then it doesn't diminish one bit from the connection and the intimacy and the passion you have with your partner. So what, what, what doesn't make sense about something like that? Because in a great marriage, your sexual connection with each other is an inherent part of the marriage. It completely informs everything. There's a virtuous circle feedback loop. It makes it sound as though such a person would be seeing sex as something really minor, like it's just a bit of fun. It's like this add-on or this plug-in that's not an inherent part of the relationship. And that seems as though the sexual relationship and the whole relationship, in fact, in the marriage would be more of this uncommitted kind of thing. It doesn't create knowledge like the fully committed all-in kind of relationship does. I mean, it doesn't in that particular area of the relationship, perhaps. But I mean, I I don't, I'm not sure. If you're suggesting that compartmentalizing sex from the rest of the relationship doesn't do anything bad in terms of the relationship, I think that's a mistake. I think that the sexual side of it is really, really important because you have this incredible sexual connection that makes it possible to solve problems that wouldn't otherwise be possible because your sexual connection makes you just feel so good and so close to each other. I just can't see how you can have that kind of amazing relationship if you're having sex with other people. And obviously, there are times when when you might be in in different countries, say, but that doesn't mean that your sexual connection isn't there. And you can still be engaging sexually, just obviously not in person. But I think that sex creates or has the power to in, in this committed kind of marriage I'm talking about creates deep, powerful emotions and it's it all feeds back on itself and it just makes so much possible that's not possible if you just see sex as this optional extra. I don't believe that it's love that makes a great permanent marriage. I, I mean, I think mm. that is important, of course. I think that it's actually the sexual connection that you have with each other that really, really glues people together forever. It's, it's like, it's an incredibly bonding thing. I mean, okay, wow, that was, yeah, you, you dropped some profound bombs there. <laughs> I, okay, so let, let me I, ponder that for a bit. Yeah. I think that modern couples, what they tend to do is, is just, they do get married, but then they're engaging in the same kind of low-level, non-knowledge creating sex of casual hookups that they've been engaging in before. And obviously that's going to lead to boredom because it's... Masturbation with a partner. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 No, that's, I mean, that's, that's a really powerful and cool view of the, the the role of the sex in the marriage. Mm. I like that. But, but at the same time, so... Sorry, thinking, I'm just going to say, if you think about it physiologically, and of course, in the future, our growth of knowledge more generally is going to 
sort out all kinds of problems that we now have, like physiologically with fight or flight, limbic mm -hmm. system reactivity and stuff. But for now, at least, physiologically, in the kind of marriage I'm thinking of, sex can really channel stress and limbic system reactivity in a combination of sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system activity that's really soothing and pleasurable. And then when your physiology is in that state, instead of limbic system going crazy, sending out fight or flight messages, <laughs> your thinking can be more rational and creative than it would be if you were in this fight or flight state. So I think it's, it's really, really powerful. And people completely underestimate the importance of the sexual connection in marriage. Wow. I mean, okay, so it's, it's essentially a way to biologically imprint, tune your nervous systems towards each other in a way that's, that's uh, not verbal and, and very intuitive. Yeah, in addition to being a knowledge-creating mm. institution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so two things there. Would, would this mean that, or rather, how would that tie into the fact that we are essentially minds and we, we happen to be in physiological bodies right now? But would that, what implications would that have for us being uh, moved to other hardware where sex is not a thing? Like, can it really be fundamental? Or are you just saying that it's, a, uh, it's fundamental because it's a way to, to really... Uh, spur on the knowledge growth that you're creating. And the knowledge growth is the fundamental I, thing. I think that your question is slightly utopian in that <laughs> okay. I can't predict the growth of knowledge and what will happen in 100 or two years or 200 years time. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I'm sure that in time, the growth of knowledge will solve many problems that we're not even aware of at the moment. So I am talking about right now and what seems to be the most fruitful idea right now. And I don't think that we have solved the problem of to enable us to have open relationships successfully. I've seen so many people who say all the right things in their open relationships, but when I'm looking at the two people in the relationship, one of them is not looking happy. One of them has suffering in his or her eyes. And I think breadth of knowledge is just nothing compared to depth of knowledge. But couldn't you say then that, because I think the fact that you're saying that just one of them has the suffering in their eyes, that to me implies that there, it is possible not to feel that way in the relationship. And perhaps if you could find two people of that same attitude as the one who's not suffering... That could possibly work. And also, I guess it's, it's different to say that it is something we don't have knowledge of as it stands or that it's something that's inherently less valuable uh, on a fundamental level. C couldn't you have perhaps, and I'm just spitballing here, because there are elements in monogamy, I don't know if you would uh, say these are just outgrowths of the, the bad non-committed version, but there are elements there of, you know, there's, there can be possessiveness, there can be a clinginess and neediness where you not wanting a person to be with someone else, for instance, is because you don't believe that you can be by yourself, you need someone else to validate you and tell you that you're okay. And oftentimes it's not even coming from you really choosing to be with a person because you you have joy in your own life and in yourself that you want to share with someone and they have the same thing and 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 that's what I want to get into next what how monogamy can be even more freeing than being single uh in, in contrast with what many people think it's it's a prison with regard to the idea of exclusive monogamy being possessive and that kind of thing i think that that's a mistake i mean think about how we feel about property that we own. Uh, <laughs> it, it's sort of like saying that we should all be anti-property, I don't know, anarcho-syndicalists or whichever group of anarchists are against property. But then if you think about the colonists who went to make a new life in America, 
initially, the system they set up didn't have any property rights. They thought we, they would have everything in common. And that just was a disaster. It didn't work. And it was only when they realised that that really didn't work that they set up a property rights system and upheld property rights. And then, of course, people felt willing to invest in their property. People invest in their property and they don't invest in property that's owned by no one or everyone. So I do think that there is a bit of this sort of disparaging idea of monogamy being possessiveness. Well, maybe there is a sense in which it's a good thing to care about your relationship. I think of my relationship as being something I own. That's not the same as owning your spouse. But when you're in a fully committed relationship, you own that relationship. And there's nothing weird about caring about it. And I think if there is absolutely zero possibility that anything ever could raise just the tiniest tinge of potential possessiveness, then maybe you don't care about it at all. Obviously, you care about something that really matters. And if you think about it, whereas with your actual property, like a computer or whatever, there's a sort of diminishing returns, you know, it loses value over time. With your relationship, it increases in value to you, to the two of you over time. So it's like the opposite of diminishing returns. So why wouldn't you care about that? Yeah, no, I think that's that's actually a fun analogy. And the important thing there to make clear is that the is the relationship that is your property, right? And not the other yeah, person. Because I right. guess that that could be, uh, yeah. It's like, what I mean, what I mean by that, owning the relationship is, I myself am 100% responsible for care about this relationship. That's what yes. I mean. No, I think that's great. And and that's cool, the whole idea of investing in your property like that. There's, uh, yeah, I like that. So my current view right now is that, I don't know how you view love, but to me, love is essentially kind of wanting the best for someone. Like you really, truly want the best for that person. And... So to me, there's just something about if you're in a relationship, it can be as committed as you want and you can really not want it to end and that would devastate you. But I still think that to have the attitude that, okay, so we're together because we're both choosing this completely non-coercively, both internally and externally, because we want to be with each other. We want to build this depth uh, these deep well of knowledge and explore each other forever that that is contingent on the other person feeling the same way towards me like i want the relationship where the other person has the same commitment that i have right and so to me i've al right. i've always seen it like if you choose to leave me and, and this is an argument against possessiveness or, or or being too jealous or stuff like that like if you choose to leave me, then you are no longer living up to that criteria of wanting to be with me because I'm the option that you wanted to choose, right? So if you find an option that you think is better uh, for your situation, it would make you happier. I, I think it would be weird if I love you to try to not get you to make that choice. And then I, I wouldn't have the relationship I wanted anymore, even if you did stay so to me, you, you can't really lose there. And I, I always lean towards the, okay, you, you explore other options if you want. Like, you know what you have with me. And I, I only want to be with you if you want to be with me over the other people. I think that's a mistake. I think that that's actually selling out on the relationship. Do explain. Let me give you an example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Let me give you an example that's not related to marital relationships. It was a relationship with a family member that I had. And for many years, this family member 
absolutely would not talk to me. And I thought at the time, well, obviously, if he doesn't want to talk to me, that's his choice. He's not consenting to talk to me. Therefore, there's nothing I can do. It takes two to create a relationship and he is not willing. And someone pointed out to me that I had sold out on this relationship and that I hadn't even tried to repair the relationship with him. And when they first said that, I was flabbergasted because every now and then over the years, I had tried to make contact. I had phoned, I had emailed, I had texted, I had visited. When I had visited, by the way, I, obviously seeking consent, had let it be known that I was going to be visiting. And so he made sure to stay away <laughs> right. when I was going to be there. So from my perspective, he seemed to be not consenting. So I thought, well, what can you do? Consent is really important. What I was doing was making what David Deutsch calls the libertarian mistake of fetishizing consent and explicit knowledge more generally. Mm. I was fetishizing explicit consent and ignoring everything else. So when this person said to me, you've sold out on your relationship, I suddenly realized that actually, if this were my marriage, there's no way I would have just said, oh, okay, you've, you've had enough. Okay, bye. No. <laughs> that wouldn't have happened. We would have sorted yeah, it out. Of course. So I, I really got what this critic was saying to me. And I thought, yeah, actually, I had sold out on it. And the moment I got that, and I went to see him without telling him I was going to see him, <laughs> you um, it was effortless wow. to solve the problem. And we now have an absolutely incredible relationship after years and years and years of no talking. So I do think that if you're married to someone and you're in a, well, I think if you're in a really good marriage, you wouldn't even be thinking like that because it would be like cutting off your <laughs> arm. Now, obviously, I'm not saying stalk someone and That's exactly you know, what you're hold, saying. A, hold a gun to their head <laughs> yeah. to keep yeah. them. What I'm saying is that there is this thing, which I'm calling commitment, that doesn't say, okay, bye, no, no, no. the moment there's a problem. So I don't agree with you about that. And yes, of course, of course, it's not going to work if you don't both want it, obviously. But why is that even a question when you've created this incredible relationship with incredibly rich knowledge? You've got this abundance of riches in your marriage. Everyone has problems. Problems are inevitable, but problems are soluble. When you have this incredible bond of a fabulous marriage, when there is a problem, even if it's a big problem, you're not seeing it as the possible end of your relationship. You know you're going to solve the problem. And the longer you've been together, the more you know that, if you have this kind of marriage that I'm talking about. Yeah, but so how does that, and of course I agree with that, I don't think that, but I, I guess the sentiment I was after there was the, the, the unconditional respect for the other person as their own person who can make their own choices and have their own preferences, right? And I, I agree with you that y you can say that, but yeah, that wouldn't be reasonable because you, what you have is so great if you're fully committed. But, um, but so how does... Actually, this is a great segue into... Yeah, the, the most common critique of monogamy and especially within, within our community here of the Popperian view of, of knowledge, right? And the unpredictability of knowledge... Mm -hmm. Yeah. How is monogamy not a prison then? Or rather, if we can frame it in a positive manner, what makes you say that being in a fully committed monogamous relationship is the opposite of a prison? It's really something that can set you 
free to a larger extent than when you're by yourself. As I said, I think it's the best known way to create this whole sphere of knowledge, and it is incredibly freeing. If your mindset is that it's a prison rather than a knowledge creating institution, then obviously it's not for you. I always find it surprising when Popperians who love the growth of knowledge and the creative, critical human mind nevertheless think it self coercive and mistaken to criticize what really are fleeting impulses from our genes, like to have sex with other people, Mm -hmm. as if those genetic impulses were somehow infallibly true and really important. And then they regard those of us in fully committed, exclusive marriages as coercing ourselves if we criticize any such fleeting impulses instead of acting on the genetic instinct like like an animal. Surely we're into human creativity, the human mind and criticism, not giving these genetic impulses this status of importance that they don't have. Mm. And what we can do in a fully sexually exclusive marriage is to use the genetic impulses to highlight and magnify our sexual connection together instead of spreading it around. It infuses the whole of your life with vibrancy and delight. I just don't see why people think that breadth of knowledge beats depth of knowledge. And think about how people in the kind of marriages that I'm talking about, they have this, and again, maybe this will change in the future when we've solved various problems, but for now, human beings have this sort of pair bonding thing and this attachment thing. So if you have this incredibly stable, delightful, happy marriage, like with a baby who has a secure attachment to her mother, when the baby has that, the baby feels able to explore and investigate things and have fun. And similarly, when you have this kind of marriage I'm describing, it makes it possible for you to, instead of spending loads of your energy hooking up with lots of different people, you have all that creativity and time and effort and energy to spend on other things that are amazingly interesting to you. Maybe nothing to do with the relationship, like you might be interested in physics or fashion or whatever it is, or you may, you may have a particular problem you're working on. So what I'm saying is when you have this secure base, it's incredibly soothing as well as exciting, yeah. and it makes it possible. You have a lot more headspace to pursue the growth of knowledge in ways that matter to you that are interesting Mm. to you. So I just don't understand the, if you're a Popperian, you'll not be married thing. (laughs) Yeah. So this was actually a really cool experience just now because I've gone into this discussion feeling like, yeah, like you said in the beginning, we do disagree on some things here and I wasn't all that persuaded. I've heard similar arguments before and, uh, yeah, when you mentioned the g- genetic impulses, like the sexual thing just being kind of like a hunger signal for your genes to go mate, mm-hmm. that's not that important in and of itself. But when you fuse that with the creative engagement and the depth of knowledge with a partner, th- that really actually made something click in my mind. And I, I think I, you actually persuaded me in real time, which is really cool. Wow. Because that's what I want with this podcast. So thank <laughs> you for that. And... um Wow, yeah, I, I really, now I need to think a lot about this, but... I think the spreading your sexual attention mm-hmm. around idea, it's, well, number one, as I said before, I think it does diminish sex into this compartmentalized thing. I think it's also a bit like thinking of sex as merely rubbing body parts together, or <laughs> scratching an itch, or playing Monopoly. It just becomes like low-level fun. Maybe it's like 
taking a drug like speed or something. It's an artificial way of getting so-called happy that doesn't create a long-term knowledge-creating institution that creates long-term happiness. It's artificial and fleeting and meaningless. And I do think it's prioritising genetic knowledge over human knowledge. I want to respond to that. I just want to plant a flag around the attachment stuff because I have something I want to add to that Mm because I think that's really important. But I, I think that we shouldn't deny that pleasure and novelty can also be joy in the beginning. Like you, well, you can. Yes. You, well, hang on a minute. If you don't have novelty in your relationship, you will end up bored and it will be stale. The growth of knowledge implies that. Yes, but, but the, the so argument is... the idea is, that you have to get it with other people doesn't... Is, just ab- doesn't absolutely. That was meant to denote that you can still be creative and be joyful in sexual encounters that are novel with people that are not someone in a monogamous relationship. So I was taking that out of the idea that you're committed to someone and then you're straying. But I think sex in and of itself... I, I know that some people can do that. But I think a lot of people need to feel safe and they don't feel safe with a new sexual partner. I mean, apart from anything, at this point in history, and obviously this won't be the case later, but you know, there are all these sexually transmitted diseases and people are always worried that the barrier won't hold and that they'll contract some ghastly disease or something. So there's an awful lot of stuff that can be interfering with the joy and pleasure that is possible. Yeah. yeah, So I think if you actually care about sex, then that is a really good argument for having a deep, fully committed, fully exclusive marriage rather than than spreading it around. It's like the opposite of what people think. No, that's actually a really great point because you're right. There's a lot of, even for really confident people, a lot of neurosis uh, often around these things, the safety parameters, but also, you know, being self-conscious, not being able to fully let your guard down with someone new. So yeah, that's actually a really good point. Yeah. So on the attachment stuff, if we go back to the freedom of a fully committed monogamous relationship, I think that there is, Mm -hmm. yeah, there's just, I, I think we've spoken about this before you and I privately where, yeah, there's, there's some kind of freedom in being able to be fully expressed as the full range of a human with all your flaws, you know, warts and all, and being unconditionally accepted by someone else who loves you and shares the, their full range of human and personness with you uh, in return. There's just something. Yeah so powerful about knowing that it doesn't matter how I wake up feeling yeah. today. I don't have to put on a play uh, or a face. I can always just express whatever I'm feeling and, and, and wanting to do. And that person will respect me for that and love me. It's um, yeah, that, that's definitely something that's hard to get by yourself. Maybe not impossible, but, but it's um, yeah, we're all damaged goods to some degree, right? From faulty parenting and, and, yeah, it's, it's really nice. It's beautiful. The idea that when you are going around having these casual hookups, think about how people behave when they are with new people. They are putting on a face. They're not being authentic. And when you're in a sexually exclusive, fully committed, all-in marriage, You have completely let your guard down. You can be completely yourself, totally authentic. And you know that even if there's a problem, even if something you say isn't acceptable, Mm. ultimately you are acceptable and deeply loved by the other person. And as you say, that creates an incredible freedom, an incredible autonomy. People imagine that this kind of marriage that I'm talking about somehow impairs your autonomy. It's totally the opposite. It increases your autonomy. And really, this idea of freedom without commitment, it's 
like being a leaf in the wind. It's not charting your own course. It's a leaf being buffeted about by the wind. Freedom isn't moving in random directions. It's focused on what moves you. <laughs> so that, that actually ties in nicely with a Twitter question that I, I know I, that we got. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is from Carl Wilsen. And he says, is self-love essential for forming good relationships with others? And I think this is an interesting question because I've uh, many times thought that there's no way for you to, or rather, you shouldn't even try to enter into a fully committed relationship before you've solved all those issues of needing someone and wanting someone to fill a void in you and stuff like that, because I felt like that would always be coming from lack rather than sharing abundance together. And I think there's something to that, but but maybe you would say... I don't agree. No, I don't no. agree. I would yeah. say it's not true that you have to be complete before you can be happily no. married. I think that, I mean, how many people are really complete? <laughs> yeah. And... We are, even you know, we are infinitely far from the truth. And that's, isn't that always the case? So, no, I don't agree. And I think that happy marriage can be healing, actually. I don't think that it's true that you have to be this whole, complete, imaginary, perfect person before you can have a good relationship. No. You just have to have a commitment to absolutely never give up. Chemistry, keep the polarity in your marriage, keep the physical attraction, develop a white-hot sexual connection together by turning towards each other and away from other people mm. and have a commitment to never give up. And that does mean that if your spouse says, I've had enough, I'm off, bye, you don't say, okay, bye. You do have to, like yeah. I said, don't sell out on your relationship. But so, okay, so that brings up another interesting question in my mind, which is, how do you view the idea that you got to find your perfect match? And the idea that you have to be so compatible, you have to share all your interests. And because uh, to me, it sounds like, if the commitment is there, you could create the knowledge with essentially anyone, uh, yeah. as long as it's mutual. I think that you do need the physical attraction, and you do need a really deep commitment to absolutely never giving up. If you have those two things, then problems are soluble. And hey, you know, we have a lifetime to solve them. Let's have an adventure and solve problems and it'll be fun and it'll be exciting and give our lives vibrancy that they wouldn't have otherwise had. I think people sometimes have a laundry list of things that they must have in a potential spouse. And many of those things are a mistake. Obviously, you don't want to marry someone who is abusive and alcoholic, that kind of thing. But apart from the obvious things, find someone who has the ability to thoroughly commit and whom your being is drawn to. I think that there's a massive inexplicit component in what makes people drawn to each other. And when you're just looking at a laundry list that says he must have a sense of humor, he must whatever, then you're missing this passionate, thrilling, inexplicit stuff that is so, so important. Yeah, the vibe. I can't put it all into words, but the inexplicit stuff is really important. Yeah, definitely. And also the fact that we're often wrong about what we think we want. So, I mean, the, the fallibilism of it all here is, uh, it's good to have that in mind because if you just have, if you have just decided on a list and it's, it's uh, completely justified to you, it's your justified true belief of romance, right? 
that that can yeah. get you in a lot of trouble. So a lot of what you think you might want is also sometimes fueled by hangups and trauma and things that are actually just coming from a place of being afraid of things and not being inspired towards things, but trying to avoid out of fear certain other things that you might actually enjoy. I don't want to pathologize people. I think we are infinitely far from the truth and there isn't a way to jump to a state of perfect knowledge. And so there are going to be hang-ups and mistaken ideas in our thinking and some of those will interfere. But the laundry list thing, when you actually meet someone who absolutely ticks all the boxes, and I'm, I'm speaking from personal experience in the distant past here, I once met someone who ticked so many boxes, it was unbelievable. Oh, I thought this person is the right person. And inexplicitly, I just couldn't stand being around him. <laughs> So there yeah. is a massive inexplicit component. Oh, for sure. And so don't be too worried about some of those explicit laundry list items. No. Just, she has to be a paparian. Just, just, yeah, just no, <laughs> <laughs> no, just notice how your being feels about the other person. And then you can create knowledge. Why not be optimistic instead of pessimistic? Why think, well, I can't be with somebody who hasn't already created all this knowledge that I've got on my laundry list, why be so pessimistic? Yeah. <laughs> no, that's cool. Optimism makes everything possible. Yeah. I mean, attitude here is everything. There's a big difference between even being 99% committed and 100% can make all the difference in the world, right? In that inexplicit yeah. congruence that you might develop with each other. But but so, so how do you view then the, because I've been having issues before with the idea of, yeah, my partner is my best friend. I used to have a lot of issues with that. I, I didn't like that way of framing it. And I thought much to the sexual point, like, yeah, you don't want to fuck your best friend. So why would you call it that? But th would you say that that makes sense? Like you do want to have that kind of chemistry with your partner that to, to call them your friend in that sense or yeah i think that the thing that is making you uneasy about that idea is that usually when people say my spouse is my best friend what they're describing is a roommate's kind of old slippers <laughs> tonic friendship sort of a marriage so I think that's why you feel like that. To be fair to the person who uses that argument, can't it be an expression of, I just really love hanging out with this person. I have so much fun with this person. Yeah. And to the extent that is it, yeah. great. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I think it is weird to think that your spouse is not your best friend. It's just... I wouldn't even think about whether or not the spouse is the best friend in the first place, if you see what I mean. It's just obviously the deepest relationship that you have, an adult relationship, obviously you could have relationships with children too, but in terms of adult relationships, it's the deepest relationship you have. How is that not your best friend? Unless best friend means... Yeah, not having sex then. platonic... Yeah. No, that's yeah. true. I want to... Uh, yeah, I want to ask you about love then, because you, you mentioned that you don't think love is the uh, driver there of the, of the good relationship. But how, how do you view love? I mean, this might be a very lofty question of, you know, what is love? But do you think it is something that plays a fundamental part in, in knowledge creation and, and joy, that it ties into that somehow? Or do you think it's just a parochial thing to us? I didn't mean to disparage love. Obviously, love is a delightful, wonderful thing that's obviously important in a marriage. It's just that I think most people, when they think about marriage, they think that love is the main thing. And I don't think that. I think that actually it's your sexual connection, your physical attraction, whether your beings are drawn to each other, 
that bonds you to each other and creates this love. So I, I didn't mean to disparage love. It's just I don't think you can have a really good marriage that is based on love and somehow doesn't have the sexual connection as an inherent part of the relationship. So, yeah, we, we've spoken before uh, when we spoke about taking children seriously. We have spoken about the idea of non-coercion. But I think that mm. this is such a major player here as well. And, yeah, could you talk a little bit about how you view rather how the importance of truly accepting your partner for who they are and not trying to mold them into yeah. who you think you think they should be because that's i think a, a big issue for many yes. people including myself sometimes yes i do think that love is accepting the experience that the other person is okay exactly the way they are and they can stay the same they can grow if they want to Whatever they want to do, it's all wonderful. I think that that is what love is, in addition to being the feeling. And part of that implies non-coercion. It does imply not trying to mould and shape your spouse. And I think people who have a sort of transactional quid pro quo kind of approach to relationships get into an awful lot of bother because they're standing on their rights and looking to see whether the other person is doing his or her fair share, allegedly. <laughs> and to me, that's not love. That's a coercive entitlement sort of thing. And love is, you just love this person and what will they create or how will they grow next? It's going to be fascinating. It is very accepting. Love is accepting. It is hard to do that, though. Uh, I guess maybe it's much, much easier once you go from the 99% commitment to the 100, because that it feels like that's kind of a one-time decision you make, and then it comes by, by default almost. But no, may maybe you have to work at it. Maybe that's too utopian, actually. On the decision thing, my experience of it is that it's an ongoing free choice. But that doesn't mean every day you're thinking, do I want to leave today? No. <laughs> it's just the experience is that it, you're fully, wholeheartedly all yeah. in. And yes, 100% is completely different from 99%. Yeah, so my, my follow-up question to that would then be, how do you square, because this is something that I find to be very difficult still, and it's how do you square that unconditional acceptance and love and commitment with having boundaries and being able to say no and not being a pushover, because I feel like many people would interpret that as Whatever my partner says and needs and wants, I'm just going to indulge that, no matter what I feel about it, because I'm. then we come into the shame and the guilt again of, oh, but I should feel like I want to do this for her, even though I don't. I think it's the other way around. I think that if you don't have good boundaries, it actually makes a non-coercive, deep, knowledge-creating relationship very difficult. When you have good boundaries, you can interact non-coercively, but if one or both of you don't, then there is an awful lot of coercion happening. Boundaries actually make relationships possible rather than making non-coercion impossible. Could you give an example of that maybe to explicate a little bit? Well, non-coercion and taking someone seriously and not molding and shaping someone is not about just going with the other person's antecedent theory. It means that you 
you both have you your engage fully your, with it. Say there's there's some kind of disagreement, and she has one idea, and you have a, a different idea. Taking someone seriously doesn't mean that you just always go with the other person's idea. That is not a solution. That is a non-solution. A solution is when you create together something that is better than either of you had in mind at the beginning of the interaction or the problem-solving process. So boundaries are actually really important because when you don't have good boundaries, you're not fully aware of what your wishes are. And then you're being a people pleaser. And then you have to be coercive to try to get yourself back on, on an even keel and stuff like that. So no, boundaries are really important. Boundaries don't in any way mean that you can't take someone seriously. It's all about knowledge creation, bro. No, it is. <laughs> no I mean, it's, it's really, I, I love how something seemingly lofty, I mean, even the world epistemology is such a fuck you and sounds so, <laughs> it's such an asshole word, <laughs> word right? But, but no, so I mean, something as, as abstract seeming as that can really, really inform a deep view on something as tangible and practically important as a romantic relationship, right? I, I, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's yeah. so cool. And it's so much deeper and more expansive and fascinating than the classic evolutionary psychology explanation, you know? We're not meant to be yes. monogamous. Look at bulls. They never have sex with the same uh, female cow twice or whatever it's called. And uh, yeah, but but that's, yeah, no, that's a very mechanical and cold type of way to view relationship and creative interaction. Yeah. It's placing a lot of importance in fleeting genetic impulses. Yeah. And don't we criticize our genetic knowledge? I mean, isn't that what human beings do? No, and I, I, I'm getting so pumped up by this now. I, I, I'm thinking I want to call this episode The Power of Monogamy or something like that. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> be, the power of be, fully exclusive, fully committed. Monogamy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's really great, actually. The knowledge-creating power of. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, now we're talking. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so... Um, I have a lot to think about there. I think I might want to just uh, go over some Twitter questions here, see if there's something we haven't already covered implicitly, if nothing else. And let's see what we have here. Oh, and by the way, I had a question first, actually, which is a little adjacent to what we've been talking about. But yeah, why do you think relationships in general are so important for a meaningful life? And do you think it's necessary for a great life or just a common thing? I think that there is this whole sphere of knowledge that can only be created in the kind of marriage I'm talking about. Mm. And as I said before, it just makes so much more possible than would have been possible without it. It's a bit like some people are couch surfers and that's their thing and they love meeting lots of new people and everything and other people, especially British (laughs) people prefer to own their own home. And that takes investment. And when they own their own home, then their creativity is free to pursue the problems that are of interest to them. That's making it sound like <laughs> a house yeah. is, is disparaging marriage, the kind of marriage I'm talking about. But it frees up your creativity is what it does. Mm. Yeah, but so would you go as far to say then that it's irrational to choose to be alone in your life and not be in a committed relationship? No, but I think I would say that committing to non-commitment is irrational. It's a bit like if you're a Popperian, some Popperians think that to be a Popperian means that you must be an agnostic. <laughs> right. But actually, that's not what being a Popperian means. What being a Popperian means is that whatever you think or choose, you are a fallible human being. So you can be an atheist if you're a Popperian. You can come down firmly on the side of atheism 
And knowledge is conjectural. So it doesn't mean you have to be an agnostic. That is sort of incoherent. And I think that for some people, there is this incoherent thing of committing to non-commitment as though that makes you rational. And I don't think it does. I'm not saying that anyone who wants to be single shouldn't be single. Obviously, you have to do what you want, because if you do something that you don't want, then how will you ever know if that choice, that decision you made was mistaken? So we always have to do what we want, because then we'll get the knowledge of if it turns out to be mistaken. And if you do something you're expecting to hate, and then you hate it, well, how do you then decide that it was the wrong decision? Because you were going to hate it anyway. Yes. But, and I'm just being facetious at this point, but could you say that it's it's wrong as an immoral to actually want to want to be single? Like that's could be fundamentally a mistake in the sense that you would create more knowledge if you were actually committed in a relationship like that. And it would be better. I'm not sure how to yeah, answer yeah. that because I do that. think that it would be a mistake to do something that you don't want to do. That doesn't mean that everything that people want to do is a good thing. You can destroy knowledge and people doing what you want to do. So it's not that whatever you want to do is necessarily knowledge creating. It's just doing what you don't want to do. Is Yeah, I meant is, rather the other way around, that, yeah. that there are a lot of things that people want to do that is wrong to want. Yes, well, I think that's true. I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what? You're not certain of that? Sarah, all right. (laughs) No, that's fair. That's fair. I do think this kind of marriage is incredibly knowledge creating and people have no idea what they're missing out on if they avoid it. If I wasn't already married, I would would go and marry right now. Yay. Likely. So, um, (laughs) yeah, it's cool. So, So I have another Twitter. It's not as much a question as it is a comment. From a Mr. Joshua Landy, MD. He put the MD in there. That's a flex. That's cool. And um, he says, I often wonder about comparing who should rule to who to marry. So Popper's uh, idea there, I suppose. And that actually ties into, I, I thought that before that, or I, I've probably heard someone say that, but the analogy between the idea of how to structure a political system being very similar to how to structure the system between you and your partner in the sense of creating behaviors and ideas that are most conducive to error correction and problem solving, right? I suppose you could say that the kind of marriage I'm describing is a commitment to a knowledge-creating, error-correcting relationship in the same way that living in a free country, there's a the equivalent error correction thing. You're not committing to antecedent theories or someone ruling, you're committing to error correction and the growth of knowledge. Yeah, and so we have someone called the Sarcastigator. All right, man. He says, given a variety of healthy relationships enhances one's life, how to justify the restrictions of monogamy. I I feel like we've touched on that quite a bit and that we don't think there are restrictions there. It's rather a way to. It's a a fully free choice that then opens up the freedom of creating this depth of knowledge. Uh, Would that be fair? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm actually going to go to the next one straight away. So that's Carnon Marcus Page. And he says, when should a relationship be ended? And uh, I guess he wants to know if he should divorce his wife, if you could tell him. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, a hard know, question, talk, right? We talked about that earlier. Yeah. I don't know. Ultimately, it's when, when you, you want, want it to. to yeah. But watch yeah, so. out for selling out on your relationship. Many, many incredible marriages have been created after people have been on the verge of divorce, when people have finally committed to each other thoroughly and then solved the problems. Problems are soluble. So do you want to solve problems with this person or not? If you think that problems aren't soluble, then I would say that you're being too pessimistic. They are soluble. 
On the other hand, if you just feel that you want to get divorced and you don't think you're selling out on the relationship like I was, that non-marriage relationship I mentioned earlier, Mm. I I don't know. I think if you're thinking about it, then something is very wrong. (laughs) Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you can't solve problems. (laughs) Problems are soluble. No, that's right. And you can solve them. I think our original intuition there, when you want it to end, is probably the best answer one can give when it's this general of a question, right? But um, so something that actually popped up in my head now and, and selfishly pertains to my own situation is what do you do with, I guess maybe you would invoke problems or soluble there too, but with something like you have this beautiful relationship, you have this commitment, you have this knowledge creating system among yourselves and you're just deeply in love and you love each other so much, but there's some fairly significant difference in your preference for something like having a child, for instance. How should one think about something like that? Obviously, you can't have a child with someone who doesn't want to have a child. No. Having a child is an incredible commitment, which you're not even aware of how big a commitment it is before you have a child. So I think that it does require both people to really want to have a child. Otherwise, I think having a child will just end your relationship. It's mm. very common that marriages break up when people have a child, even, even when the child is wanted, let alone when one of the parties doesn't want it. I think that that would lead to terrible resentment over time. But when someone currently says that they don't want a child, it doesn't mean that that will always be the case. No, people People change their mind a bit later in their life. Yeah. And if having a child is more important to you than your marriage, then I think the marriage probably need some work Mm. so i I don't know but it's a genetic it's a genetic thing i have i need a kid because my genes tell me to right (laughs) as you know we're human beings and we we can criticize our genetic impulses yes we can it's possible in some cases that the person might be persuaded genuinely wholeheartedly persuaded If the picture you're painting of how this will be isn't how the other person is expecting it to be, there might be something specific that would make the difference. So unless the other person doesn't want to keep talking about it, in which case one must back off, obviously. But it is possible that someone who doesn't want a child because they're imagining that they will then be spending all their time with the child and that's not what they want at this time in their life, it's possible that if the idea you have is different from that and you paint a different picture, that might make a difference. But I would be very careful about having a child with someone who isn't 100% wholeheartedly into the idea. I think it's a recipe for disaster. Yeah, I I think that's a very important point, that having a kid is... I mean, everyone does. (laughs) <laughs> not everyone, but a lot of people have kids and it seems like it's not that big of a deal. Look, everyone has kids and there are a lot of shitty parents. And But um, but yeah, it can, it, it can really make or break, or, or rather it can really make all the difference in the world if you truly want to be a parent, if you want to create yeah. a happy, creative being in this world. So yeah, I don't, I don't think that should be taken lightly. I would actually love to end on that note of problems are soluble and uh, the power of fully committed uh, knowledge creating monogamy as a uh, yeah as a working title there. So um, yeah, Sarah, I had a, a really really good time, and thanks again for for pushing back hard enough for me to actually change my ideas there. This was super fun, and uh, oh, I appreciate so you coming. Welcome. I, I've had a blast too, Christopher. We created some knowledge here together. (laughs) Yeah, all right, Sarah, take care. 